Alrighty, so as we approach the release of the Abattoir of Zir, the new pinnacle content for everybody who's been theory crafting and thinking about what they need, I wanted to go over a quick little rubric of things that I think that you should be focusing on. Remember this, I have played the Abattoir of Zir. I had a sneak peek at it just before BlizzCon. So while I'm not going to reveal things that have not been said in public, we can already derive a huge amount of information from what they've put in into videos, into interviews, and what we know thus far. So keeping this rubric in mind, the first thing that's most important is that you need to get armor capped. You have to remember that monsters are going to be higher level than even Nightmare Dungeons. A tier 25 Abattoir of Zero monster is going to be level 179. And for you to have the maximum amount of physical damage reduction, 85%, in your armor, you need to have 15,000 armor, a little bit less than that. What it means is though, depending on how many plus total armor rolls you have across your gear, the amount that you personally are going to need is going to be a little bit different. After that, we need to worry about maximizing our resistances. I think in this content, you're going to need to be max res across the board. So whether that means putting additional resistances on a pair of boots, using different types of gems in your jewelry, etc., those are going to need to be capped. And then after that, we want to be able to stack as many forms of damage reduction on as many gear pieces as possible. In the Abattoir of Zero, we're going to be in a dungeon where we need to be able to kill a huge amount of density to spawn a boss and then kill that same boss. So mobility isn't something that's going to be as important here you still need a little bit to be able to dodge attacks but you're going to see a lot of people running things like this a two three or even four damage reduction stat amulet as opposed to what you're typically used to so after we have all of our defensives down we need to start talking about actually stacking damage itself because you're on a timer. If you run out of time, you fail the dungeon, you get nothing, you don't cross go, you don't win $200. So being able to stack on as much damage as possible to the build, as opposed to just nice to have utility aspects or things that generally make quality of life a little bit easier, are probably gonna go by the wayside. Lastly, on every single build that I possibly can, and luckily the Necromancer is blessed with a lot of options here, we're looking to stack as many continuous crowd control effects as possible. Because the moment that the monsters start moving, they become a danger to you. If you can keep them all clumped up in one area, it's much easier to appropriately and effectively apply your damage as efficiently as possible. So we're going to be starting off with the Infinimus build here on max roll. This is going to be updated on the website within the next couple days after you see this video, but I'm literally going to break down every single piece of gear, aspects, the changes to stats, the skill tree. I even do different sacrifices and Paragon and vampire powers. The whole build got a complete overhaul to be able to factor in everything that I just spoke about. So feel free to jump around to the different timestamps if you feel like you just need a little bit of help with one thing or the other thing. I'm not gonna be offended, this video is for you. But look forward to this being updated in the Maxwell Guide as well, with a breakdown in the guide itself about why we made these decisions. Probably the biggest hurdle for the Infinimus Necromancer is maximizing its boss damage output. Now, luckily with the addition of X-Fall's Ring and being able to reprioritize for a stagger in crit chance and then crit damage, we have a really good tool. So basically what we needed to do with the rest of the build is make sure that our damage reduction was up to snuff, that we had stacked as many contingency plans for damage as possible, and then any changes that are more nuanced for what the build is going to look like. For the helmet, maximum life, lucky hit, chance with barrier, cooldown reduction, and then total armor, we're putting might onto the build so that that, in addition to our reap, is going to be generating a huge amount of additional damage reduction whenever we use reap, and we're going to be able to proactively use reap for corpse tendrils much more often. There's a world where you could swap out this for blight, and I don't think that that's necessarily wrong, but I'm looking to take a build into this that will work for for everybody and have consistent output as opposed to any other janky setup that might be sacrificing some consistency for damage output i'm looking to keep it as smooth as possible here for the armor maximum life total armor damage reduction from close and damage reduction from shadowed here's where we're putting shielding storm on the gloves, lucky hit chance, crit chance, attack speed, and then lucky hit chance to slow. The reason why we want to keep this on our piece of gear, not only just for general crowd control, but it's a great tool for being able to stagger a boss more quickly since all of our damage over time abilities are going to stack on top of them and be able to proc this lucky hit slow multiple times and that's going to drastically increase our stagger speed. Here's where we're currently putting Grasping Veins. There is a universe where I actually want to swap Grasping Veins over to the Amulet and then swap this over to the Gloves just so that we can rely on being able to crit more often. On the pants, I was going back and forth with whether or not I could use Tibalt's Will for additional damage and I think that there's a universe where you realistically could. The major issue though is that I wanted to be able to have Disobedience somewhere on the build. You could swap it up here onto Might if you really wanted to, but I'm thinking at first, 
let's go with maximum survivability and actually get through the dungeons and then let the glyph and powering up the glyph increase our damage and scale our damage that way. If it turns out that after you have enough damage and enough additional power from the glyph that you can actually remove some survivability, Tibalt's Will is going straight back onto these pants, but maximum life, total armor, damage reduction from close, damage reduction from shadowed, and then again this is where we have disobedience. For the boots, this is where I'm actually swapping back in for explosive mist aspect, because we're not going to be using the sacrilegious ring. While the ring is nice, I think having decay on the build is going to be required for being able to put out that consistent high crit damage against a large amount of monsters as well as against a boss. So we need to have a way of actually engaging the Infinimist engine here, so that's why we need explosive mist. Again, if it turns out that we don't need as much survivability as we currently do, I would love to be able to put on the Greaves of the Empty Tomb for an additional damage reduction that we can't typically get, but more lucky hit chance as well. And theoretically, be able to put Sacrilegious Ring back onto the build to automate some of the gameplay. For our boots, we're still using movement speed in at least one slot here. I do think that completely removing movement speed from your build it might be a death sentence, might make it too hard to be able to dodge ranged attacks or scenarios where you need to be on your toes here. So at least one roll of movement speed and then corpse tendrils, cold resistance to be able to finish maxing out our resistances, and then dodge chance against distant. You notice I don't have damage reduction against distant. I'm basically hoping that we can get in close as we normally would through the typical gameplay loop of an Infinimus Necromancer, but a little bit of dodge chance to just straight out ignore 15% of incoming damage from distant monsters basically means we've just gained that much more chance to effectively survive something we shouldn't be able to normally. For the amulet, luckily on Infinimist, movement speed pseudo translates into effective damage dispersal. Since we want to be able to spread out as many damage over time effects across the majority of the combat field, depending on what the scenario is. So I'm still prioritizing movement speed here, but then in addition to that, ranks to gloom and then lucky hit chance with barrier and damage reduction from close enemies. This could also be total armor. This could also be damage reduction from shadow targets as opposed to the lucky hit. But lucky hit is how we scale our damage procs, so we can't just throw this stat away in its entirety. For the ring, damage to close, lucky hit chance, crit chance, and then maximum life. And then here's where we're putting decay, just a great damage multiplier for our shadow blade, a great tool to be able to continuously put out damage against a boss, also before it's staggered and then after it's staggered. It's just such a great tool in general. And then obviously X-Fall's ring here. You notice I'm using rainbow gems and then a single resistance here. We're going to get shadow resistance from our paragon tree. But the other interesting thing to note, and this kind of goes across the board for every single necromancer build, if you're struggling to get your armor cap to the point that you need to, you can always sacrifice defenders for 20% all res, which in combination with the passive from our skill tree actually gets you 32% all resistance, which just means that you don't need any gems to be able to cap out typically on just about every single necromancer build and then you'd be able to put skulls into your jewelry here. I personally want to hold on to the damage bonus from Reapers because I think Infinimist is going to need it, but if it turns out that I still need even more armor in some way, shape, or form, I would very quickly swap this over and then swap these over to Skulls. For the wand, damage to close, vulnerable damage, intelligence, and then all stats here. This is where we're putting ultimate shadow, the necessary thing to keep the entirety of our engine going, and then we are using Lidless Wall. It turns out that perpetual barrier generation with 15% damage reduction and 20% chance to crit is really powerful. Powerful. I think you're going to see a lot of people relying on Lidless Wall, at least to start, when we're walking into the Abattoir of Seer, because it just brings so much to the table. But again, there might be a point where at a certain breakpoint on the glyph itself, which we'll get to in a little bit, that you're actually able to swap this out perhaps for another damage multiplier to be able to increase your clear speed, or just like a shield with four types of damage reduction in case that's somehow necessary. Book of the Dead, we've already covered it slightly, but we are sacrificing Reapers, we're sacrificing Cold Mages, and then we're sacrificing Iron Golem. Nothing particularly unique inside of the skill tree, but I still just wanted to cover the options that we are going with here. Reap, as an obvious tool, to be able to generate corpses, as well as generating that damage reduction whenever we use the skill itself. Three points into Hued Flesh to be able to generate corpses. And I am maxing out Blood Mist here with Blood Mist Generates Corpses. This is going to be an incredibly important tool for us because it turns out you can survive most things when you're completely immune to damage and Blood Mist. I am still maxing out Corpse Explosion. It just turns out there isn't really another great place to put these points other than maybe down into Corpse Tendrils itself, but we're maxing out everything that we need. So I don't think that there's a big value to gain anywhere. 
just one point into Grim Harvest and then three points into Fueled by Death. Coming down into Decrepify with Abhorrent Decrepify, the major tool that this build uses, three points into Amplify Damage, and then obviously Death's Embrace for the damage reduction and the damage to close targets. There is also a scenario, and just to play Devil's Advocate here, where you would unironically put the additional four points into Decrepify just to increase that slow effect and decrease the damage that the monsters deal. We're not talking about a ridiculous amount of damage increase here, but an additional 3.8% damage reduction is definitely not nothing. And then the additional slow percentage would increase your stagger rate against a boss. For now, I'm going to leave the points in Corpse Explosion just as a little bit of additional damage from this tool that we're using. But I could definitely see a world where when you're trying to push into like tier 25, if anybody realistically gets there, the additional slow and the additional damage reduction here might make or break the build. Just the one point into Corpse Tendrils because we are getting so many ranks from our boots and then obviously we're picking up Vulnerable when we apply it, maxing out everything in the Shadow Tree, three points into Standalone for the damage reduction, three points into Memento Mori, Bone Storm, and then Shadow Blight the key passive. Now the Paragon board is where things are going to get a little bit wild and you really have to start asking the question, what is important to my build to be able to function? when you need to fill up this much of a glyph area for the Tears of Blood. Now, there is one big assumption that's being made here. The Tears of Blood graphic that we saw refers to core stats. And when we are talking about core stats, all four of these are referred to as core stats in the game. Now, I originally thought that it was main stat. In this case, for the Necromancer, main stat is intelligence. But the picture said core stats, and if that means we need to pick up every single core stat within range of a glyph, then Flesh Eater is the best board to be able to do this. Going through all of the different boards that are available for the Necromancer, it's very easy to see how many core stats are within range of all of them. And if we ignore the fact that the rare bonus is going to increase rare nodes, the base core stats around every single board that the Necromancer has is pictured here, with Flesh Eater clearly being the best, the second best being Hulking Monstrosity, but most builds probably don't want to build into Hulking Monstrosity since it only pertains to the Golem. And then as a runner-up, you also also have Scent of Death. The only issue with Scent of Death is that a lot of the points that you need to get to are very inefficient and go through very bad nodes, whereas Flesh Eater, which we can very clearly see here, has incredibly valuable nodes for any build. It has damage to elites as well as all resistance. So this, along with the rest of the stats that we have, are just hugely valuable to be able to bump up with the rare node bonus that the glyph is going to give. But on top of that, for every five core stats you have within range, you gain a heinous amount of multiplicative damage. And that's why this glyph is going to be the thing that you are going to be grinding out with the amount of glyph XP that you get in the Abattoir of Zir to perpetuate your damage and to actually be able to scale to be able to do the content itself. So prioritizing getting this glyph as high as possible, as quickly as possible, is the most important thing that you can do. On top of that, the glyph doesn't increase its radius until rank 50, you heard me right, rank 50, but it starts off at radius four, and then it will bump up to radius five. So I'm gonna show you what the rank one setup looks like on the boards, and then show you the rank 50, and then as far as I'm aware, it should not increase in radius after that point. For our starter board, we're still going to be picking up the Darkness Glyph. The additive damage on the Darkness Glyph is going to very quickly get overshadowed by the Multiplicative from Tears of Blood, but Darkness says that you gain additional damage reduction against any targets that are dealt shadow damage. If it turns out that this damage reduction is not necessary, I would very quickly swap this over to Scourge, because Scourge gives us a damage multiplier against targets that are inside of shadowed effects. So. This is one that may swap over depending on what the scenario looks like, but either one of them is going to be very good for your first time walking into the abattoir. I am maxing out all the survivability options down here, and then I am picking up all armor as well. In the wither board, I'm still using control. Control is going to be awesome for density clearing. Also, we are looking to stagger bosses at very fast rates, so we are going to get this damage multiplier against them as well. I'm not picking up every single option here, but the shadow resistance in this board does make it so that we don't need to include an additional resistance on our boots. Then picking up a little bit of shadow damage, I'm still building into just about everything that's valuable inside of Wither, assuming that uh, the Wither node 
continues to be valuable for our corpse explosion damage it might just turn out that it is not so we can regain some of the points right here for additive damage elsewhere on our board or more survivability as needed building into scent of death i am hitting effectively the minimum requirement for essence just to get that damage modifier once monsters are no longer healthy so that we can increase our x-fall proc damage as well Obviously, a legendary node is incredibly valuable. And then we are picking up Ruin to slightly increase our rate of getting monsters out of the healthy status so that we can activate Essence Glyph. On top of that, it just gives a good amount of additive critical strike damage, so it's definitely not a dead stat. And the reason why we are building this Incentive Death is because we're incentivized to pick up the Dexterity here and be able to pick up additional armor nodes as well. In Flesh Eater, Flesh Eater is real easy to look at. One, you pick up every single node around Tears of Blood, and then you pick up the Legendary node as well. You may build down into stifle just for the crit damage i think that is not worth it at this point because we are going to have so much multiplicative damage here and we're picking up so many more ubiquitous forms of additive damage that will also increase x falls so that we don't need to worry about these like suboptimal nodes down here and then lastly, we are building into Territorial. This is also a minimum requirement Territorial, mostly just to get the damage reduction stat. And then also because there's a little bit of a bonus in like the bone skill damage here for Bone Storm, technically speaking. Don't worry about it. You're not actually going to hit the requirements for this node. But a little bit of close damage as well is definitely going to go a long way, at least in the beginning, before your Tears of Blood glyph is fully activated. Lastly, for the Vampiric Powers, again, we're trying to pick as many options for survivability and damage output put as possible. Resilience is just straight up damage reduction. Every time you take damage, you get more damage reduction. So this thing seems like an auto include. You can also go with undying so that every single time that you trigger any of your skills, you get to heal. I think that straight up damage reduction is just more important than being able to heal this way since we are going to have potions and we can always heal that way. You'll notice that I'm not using anticipation. You might go, well, why aren't you using anticipation? Well, it turns out Lidless Wall gives you infinite bone storms and we are also an Infinimus build. So we're going to be resetting this thing's cooldown all of the time anyways. That being said, it would help with a little bit of additional damage out of Bone Storm itself. So if it turns out that you don't need resilience, you can throw back on anticipation and then not really worry about it anymore. Prayer in the Week, because it says vulnerable damage and that's pretty great. Domination, because it says the moment that we stagger or CC anything, we get an additional 1.24 multiplier. Sanguine Brace here gives us an option to be able to fortify and we should be able to maintain fortified status very easily since we'll have near permanent uptime on barrier. So that's just another 10% damage reduction. And then on top of that, we're also going to gain that additional crit chance so that we can proc X falls and do as much damage as consistently as possible. And then obviously Metamorphosis, you're never going to get rid of this thing. Do keep in mind that Metamorphosis can trigger Lucky Hit at an incredibly high rate. It's not just 100% of the uptime, but you'll notice most times that if you Metamorphosis through a monster while you have Bone Storm active, even on top of your Necromancer themselves, you will proc Lidless Wall and leave a Bone Storm behind you. Just adding to the overall value of metamorphosis on the build, not only for mobility, but for being able to proc all of our various lucky hit abilities at an incredibly high rate as well. Sadly, it doesn't proc X falls because it's not a damage over time ability, but it will proc the lucky hit from Abhorrent to Crepify, it will proc Hued Flesh, and it will proc Lidless Wall dropping Bone Storms. So let's talk about how good I think Infinimus will be for the overall content. One, it's obviously phenomenal at clearing density. So the faster and faster that you can accomplish that, the more time that you buy for being able to fight the boss. And I do think that that has an incredible amount of value. On top of that, with the innovation with X Falls, being able to output a considerable amount of damage against bosses, even in Nightmare Dungeon 100, where I was killing them anywhere between like 20 to 25 seconds on a fully optimized build, means that even if it takes me like two, three minutes to kill a boss, we should be able to get there. Now, hopefully, again, with the scalability of the glyph, we should be able to bring that damage into a much healthier and higher place, where maybe we can remove some of our damage reduction to be able to stack on even more damage options. Ultimately, like I said, I'd love to be able to get eight Tibolts on here. I would also love to be able to just run Blight on the build for the 1.15 multiplier. So there's definitely a world where we don't need Reap, and that means that we don't need Might Aura either. So we can throw on Audacity, or we can throw on Protected, so that we can just gain pure immunity every once in a while. There's a lot of wiggle room on the build, and I think as we get stronger and stronger with the glyph, we'll see higher and higher levels of optimization. I'm personally going to be starting with Infinimist in the Abattoir of Zero because I think it just pound for pound is going to be the easiest to pilot walking in, and it's going to give me a really good vehicle for being able to level my glyph as fast as possible. A lot of people are asking me, am I building for maxing out tier clear, or am I trying to build speed farm to be able to sit there on lower levels? And I think every single build is effectively gonna have to do both. 
you're realistically building for the highest tier that you can possibly clear because what else are we doing right everybody wants to clear a tier 25 but you're probably eventually going to stall out and at that point you are just going to have to run the highest tier that you possibly can for the glyph experience it's no different than any other nightmare dungeon and the experience that we've been having in those just multiplied to a ridiculous level if there is going to be a necromancer build that can easily survive all the way into tier 25 while being able to output damage my money is on infinimist because it just turns out being immune is a really good defensive stat on top of that a lot of the build can be automated if you could take off some damage or some of the survivability and then it can make for a really clean gameplay loop like if i could put sacrilegious back on this thing and then basically have the dungeon kill itself I'd love to be able to do that as well. I think it's going to be one of the better builds that the Necromancer has available to it. And I think that only problems that we might be able to run into is if we can or cannot have a boss swap of gear in there. I know that there was some Diablo 3 content where you actually just couldn't change anything about your build. And this is very clearly hinting at being effectively the greater rifts of Diablo 3. So if there's a world where like I can't bring in a boss swap to be able to kill them more quickly, Maybe every build needs to be completely utilitarian. I think that Infinimus has a really good structure to be able to accomplish that most easily. That's what I've thought up thus far. I spent a lot of hours theory crafting this as well as all the rest of my builds. So look forward to other videos covering the rest of my build guides on max roll and this level of depth about the decisions that I've made. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, if you thought of something better, if you're also theory crafting this, please let me know down in the comments. I would love to hear from you. Right now is like my most favorite time in any video game, which is there's new comments content we don't know exactly what we're doing and we're all just trying our best to come up with the like strongest possible options as always if you wouldn't mind subscribing to the channel if you're new here and you appreciate this level of content i'd love to have you around more often maybe hit that bell notification i don't know other people say that i'm not exactly sure what it does i think it bugs you more often so like if it's the difference of subscribing and not getting notifications just don't hit it but if you want to, go ahead. I don't want you to miss out on any of these videos. And if you wouldn't mind leaving a like on the video, I'd truly appreciate it. But as always, thank you so much for watching this video. I truly, truly hope that it helps. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one.